Welcome to The Holy Post. On recent shows, we've talked about gun control policies, and we've got some listener feedback to those episodes. And we also talk about the appeal to self-defense used by those who oppose more gun control. They say that we have a God-given and constitutional right to defend ourselves with lethal force if necessary. But is there any real evidence to back that claim? This week, because Caitlin and Christian are both away, Phil and I have invited our friend Mike Erie, the host of the Voxology podcast, to join us for a biblical discussion about Christian self-defense. Then I talk to author Lena Abujamra about her new book, Fractured Faith, Finding Your Way Back to Faith in an Age of Deconstruction. She talks about how deconstruction is often triggered not by cultural doubts about Christianity, but rather a toxic church leadership culture that leaves many of us wounded and questioning our faith. All of that, plus California declares that bees are fish and scientists engineered violent murder hamsters. Just a quick heads up about content for this episode, because we are talking about gun violence again, we are also dealing with issues of suicide, so if that's a sensitive topic for you, I again encourage you to skip ahead to the interview and come back and listen to the news segment later. All right, here is episode 512. Hey there, welcome back to the Holy Post Podcast. I'm Phil Vischer. I'm here with Sky Jitani. Hi, Sky. Hi, Phil. Hi. And we don't have a Caitlin, and we don't have a Christian, because they're both out of the country, so we brought in an Eerie. We have uh, you know, Mike Erie. Like Mike Erie is choice. Here. I'm yeah. just saying, third yeah. choice is pretty amazing. I, um, and I have a confession. I have yeah, a confession, oh, Phil. What? What's your confession, Mike? Well, Sky has on his Twitter bio that he is ethnically ambiguous. Yeah. And I just I feel like I need to clarify. I am ethically ambiguous, and I oh. just felt like I wanted to <laughs> oh, I wanted to get that out there. Just to, at the start, so we can just sort of warn the listeners. Can you put that in your Twitter bio, Mike? You know, I should and see if yeah, anyone knows. And see no anyone one correlates. Knows. Oh boy, should we dive yeah. into that? Should that be our topic for the day, um, Mike Erie's uh, can, uh, ethic yeah. ambiguity? Yeah, I can go anywhere. That could uh-huh. be the. That's Twitter the point. Bo- that's the point. Uh huh. Okay. I can get behind I'm- any view at all. I'm just They'll not just sure. say something. I'll agree with it. I'm not sure just how I feel about bitter, this. Huh? So instead of yes. saying anything for fear of what Mike Erie will say next, I'm going to play the theme song. What's the news that you like the most? Who's your favorite podcast host? If it's breakfast, get your toast. It's Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. With special guest host Mike Erie. Okay, I'm back with Sky and Mike, who went to college together. You don't have to say it that way. You can say I what? Mean, say the, there's because you, like Sky, you're excited about that, and then it's Sky and Mike. It's like oh, no, Jesus no, no, says no, tax no. collectors no, and no, sinners. No, 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 no Mike. It's, it's the not. opposite. He is so done with me after ten years. He's excited uh-huh. to have some fresh blood <laughs> yeah. on the show. <laughs> Fresh blood, fresh blood. What's your um, What's your name on our recording today, Sky? He puts a new name in every week. Uh, I think it's Perky McJerky. Perky McJerky. Yeah, per- that's perfect. nice. Yeah, that's nice. Because Mike, you see, Mike, I was I was criticizing Sky for sometimes being a bit of a downer, and so what? he start he started giving himself um, peppy optimistic. Screen names when we record as a, a form of self help and self motivation. So this week it's Perky McJerky. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel confident which I, rolling which into I think this. is the is the kind of uh, jerky you make from very optimistic uh, cows. Perky. Well, they- Obviously, their jerky. optimism was not well placed. If they're now jerky, <laughs> May, no, no. Uh, yeah, That's fair. Okay. So. It's been a rough few weeks. We need something that's a little less rough. I need a, I just need some slightly lighter stories. This one is about the state of California who just made a ruling. You think, oh, no, a controversial ruling, probably about abortion or guns or something, and everyone's going to get mad and throw rocks at each other. No, no. Last week, California court ruled that bees can be classified as fish. What? I'm just going to leave that, that real? sitting there for a is second. Is that real? Is that the Babylon Bee announcing that? What's happening? Mike, are you th- are you saying that I would bring fake news to my show? Well, Phil, I used to know you. 
but now you have a new screen background and I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure what's happening. Yeah, I built I built a wall. Phil built a wall. That's a new book that Eric Metaxas is writing. <laughs> Phil builds <laughs> a wall. Yes, yes. Uh, California genius. court rules that bees can be classified as fish. A California judge ruled this week that bees can now be legally defined as fish under and state a, conservation law. And what is exactly a fish? Is this an, an animal that... Didn't Matt Walsh scales? have a conversation about this? Didn't Matt Walsh? I, I probably did. I don't know. The decision comes from California's Third District Court of Appeal, which ruled on Tuesday that the California Endangered Species Act can protect bees. In 2020, the Sacramento County Superior Court ruled that the California Fish and Game Commission could not list invertebrates like bees under the California Endangered Species Act. So here's the deal. There's an existing structure in California for protecting endangered species under the Fish and Wildlife Act. It they couldn't put they couldn't find bees in there anywhere. And there's a problem because bees are in trouble and California really needs them as pollinators and they needed to, some laws to protect bees. So they went back and, and apparently apparently it was hard to like do a whole new protection mm. act just for mm. bees. So they had to figure out if they could fit bees in under the existing protection act somehow. So as part of the larger California fish and game code, which defines a fish as a wild fish, a mollusk, a crustacean, an invertebrate or an amphibian. Mm -hmm. So for that That's code, fair. amphibians were also fish. Uh, the code's definition of fish created an opportunity where bees could be legally classified as fish since bees are invertebrates. So they got a court to decide, okay, a bee is a fish, so we can now protect them. I think this you, is part my, of the reason why people don't really trust lawyers. I, I was going to say it's it's why people don't <laughs> trust California. It's like what what? But so it was it was a legal pragmatism to try to get some defense mm -hmm. on the books mm -hmm. for bees, and the fastest way to go about it. Do you think this is going to make people feel more or less comfortable with the idea of redefining gender and redefining man and woman? You know, and oh, look what the liberals are Listen, doing now out in California. I've the land of said, fruits and nuts. If you mess with gender, you're going to invertebrates. It is a natural progression. <laughs> it's a slippery so, slope. So this is proof. I've been saying this for years, guys. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, they it's a came for slope. They came for the women, and we said nothing. And then they came <laughs> for the bees, and no one was left to say anything. Sky. So if I go, Sky. Can I go, back go up for peaky. a second? Go no, 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 no. If we, <laughs> I, oh, I'm perky. curious what what was in the original statute. Did, did it actually say vertebrate animals are only included here? Like, you're, wouldn't it just say animals and bees qualify as an animal, right? It was fish. It was fish. Yeah, fish. but it's bigger than fish mm. because the the Endangered mm. Species Act isn't just Endangered Fishes Act. I don't. Right? I don't. Is know. a mollusk a fish? No, that's read. the point. I and mollusk read. was in there. I know, I know. They defined fish um, in the California Fish and Game Code as wild fish, mollusks, crustaceans, invertebrates, amphibians. So it was a very broad definition of fish for the purpose of this act. And they just said, well, technically, couldn't we put bees in there? And one court said no. And another court said, yes, the bee okay. is now a fish. It's really to be or not to be. I mean, that's the question. Oh, um, yeah. A bee or not bump. a bee. But up, bump. Okay, Come I have on. one more story. I have one more story from the world of science, which <laughs> is a little, this one's a little That scarier. wasn't science. That was not science. <laughs> <laughs> Bees are now fish. I Don't think call that science. science. I think yeah, that's, that's science, true. guy. That's true. Okay. You blinded uh, me with science right there. This is in the, you know, what could possibly go wrong category of, oh, oh, it did go wrong. Oops. Scientists accidentally made a vicious mutant attack hamster. They didn't mean to. So where do you find these stories? Phil? It was like, an accident. Like, what do you type into your Google search that these, leads you to stories such as these? I think they these find him. Stories find me. Yes. These stories find me. That's and do you know why? Do you know why? Algorithms. Holy oh, Spirit. the algorithms. The, no, oh, the Holy I, Spirit. Yes. 
the Holy okay. Spirit. Is right. our algorithms the Holy Spirit for millennials? Is That's that fair. how they feel I mean, scripture, a, a strange warming in their in their heart, in their chest? If scripture was being written in this day and age, I'm sure algorithm would have some kind of analogous mm-hmm. spiritual meaning. Just like put off the old spirit algorithm, means breath and, put on and the and new breath. one. Right. Yeah. Right. In a recent study published in the Scientific Journal of Neuroscience, a group of scientists regale their journey to try and use CRISPR gene editing technology to bioengineer an extra friendly and extra chill hamster. The researchers used CRISPR-Cas9 to remove a naturally occurring hormone that is typically Mm. expected to regulate things like teamwork and bonding. Their hypothesis was that by removing this hormone, the hamsters would stop regulating their friendliness and just give in to being cuddly and adorable bosom buddies all the time. Okay? (laughs) Wait a minute. By removing the gene that creates bonds and friendliness no. and teamwork, they thought it would make them more no, friendly? No, like regulates it up and down. That regulates it up and down. See, I'm making kind of a fish-like motion with my hand. Mm-hmm. Regulates mm-hmm. it up and more down. More of a so they thought, motion. They mm. thought that the, the hamsters would then be stuck in the bonding-friendly mode. Okay, I of think course. Okay. was the theory. Mm-hmm. And, in fact, that did not happen. The opposite what? happened. It had the what? opposite effect. The Jurassic hamsters... Park? Have we learned nothing from Jurassic Park? <laughs> the Jurassic hamster. The hamsters <laughs> became incredibly aggressive, territorial, um, and violent towards other hamsters of the same sex. It sounds like the premise for the next animated Oops. kung fu movie. Oh, yes. Yes. Animated kung fu movie. They're all, every there's. I just saw a trailer for another one yesterday. Another animated animal movie where the animals are doing martial arts. Oh, we had Kung oh, Fu Panda one through okay. fifteen. Yeah. Now yeah, we've got this yeah, other thing yeah. coming out. There's all these. So now it's gonna be hamsters. Yeah. So do you think? Do you think maybe scientists should be just a little bit wary of gene editing? Like, okay, it's a good thing they tried it with a hamster and not like a T Rex. Hey, we brought a T Rex back. Let's make them more friendly. <laughs> I think I know how. Let me try. I want. I want to know who got funding for this project. Hey, hamsters aren't friendly oh, enough. We, we need friendlier hamsters. We, and well, someone, someone and, with money said, "Hey, that's a great project. We should spend money on." And what was the the ultimate goal? Like, here's here's our yeah. thinking: Where's if we can going? prove if we can prove this in hamsters, maybe we could gene edit humans to be cuddlier and friendlier. Is that where they were going with it? Yeah, uh, the whole CRISPR technology. I know that there's a lot of medical benefit from using uh-huh. it to explore, but it scares the crap out of me. Uh huh. Uh huh. I think I think everyone. One Christmas, CRISPR at home technology is going to be the hot gift, and every kid is going to get a little CRISPR set so they can do their own gene editing at home. And then in a salamander, that'll be. It's gonna be like like gremlins. It's gremlins. CRISPR sounds like the brand gene editing toys. Yeah, that's that's the end. All right. Maybe this maybe this had marital applications for one spouse. To gene edit the, more cuddly. The spouse? Maybe that was what where where, where this yeah. train was going. Right. I'm which, just saying. I which, don't know. Which spouse? Each of you tell me which spouse, which partner in your marriage needs a little gene editing to be friendlier. Yeah. yeah Honey, we're I'm gonna not... go to a marriage retreat. It's a CRISPR retreat. <laughs> <laughs> and one of us is gonna come back better. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not gonna say who. It's gonna uh, be a surprise. Yeah. This is where being ethnic. Ethically ambiguous is helpful. Uh huh. Very much. Yeah. Right. Right. Who's friendly? Who's considered friendlier in your marriage, Mike? You or your wife? Because I haven't met your wife. I I know Sky's wife, so I know who's friendlier in that marriage. Who's friendlier in your marriage? It's definitely not the guy named Perky who names himself Perky McPerkerson. It it Um, has to do that as a way to try to get him to be a little less dour. Yeah. Mm. Visual. (laughs) Yeah. Tacit. Taciturn. Um. (laughs) Uh, I would say I'm I'm more gregarious, but my wife, if you're in with my wife, she's the better friend. Oh, okay. Yeah. I hear you. But okay. she's a she's a she's a li- like limited like span of friends, but if you're in there, dude, you're in there forever. Okay. And it's, so you're you're yeah. more all over the room working Shocking. the crowd. <laughs> working yeah. it. Yeah. Totally, working it. Totally. Yep. Shocking. Yep, CRISPR okay. this is what I say. 
Okay, we did um, on Friday. Sky did a French Friday episode with David French, and they talked yes. about gun control. And Sky took a position that we need more gun control. And David was like, "Yeah, maybe a little in some areas, but be careful, be careful." And I have to say, I think we got more negative <laughs> interaction with our audience than any other hmm. show in 10 years about pushing back that against David. Yes. Yes. Mm. Many people not happy with David's take on gun control and mm. wanting uh sky to uh, like, you know, even just give it to him harder. Like you, you, you don't let him get away with that sky. Okay. Before we get into the, that whole thing, I just want to take a step yeah. back for a moment and Phil, you know, this okay. well, we, over the years we have gotten criticized pretty frequently from people saying you guys only have guests on your show that you agree with and you need to have mm. more oppositional yeah. interviews. And David French and I have been talking for years doing these French Fridays for a while now. And from time yeah. to time we do disagree, but I just hope that those critics listen to that episode and realize, no, we don't just have people that are in lockstep with our own views. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I, I was kind of surprised by the amount of pushback that, we got from this yeah. episode for David and uh, but yeah, it's worth talking yeah. about. It was interesting. So, um, so a couple of things, someone wrote it and said, I appreciate the conversation linking suicide prevention to the conversation about gun regulation. However, I sincerely mm. disagree with David French on this episode. What bothers me the most is the statement that there is no data when there's an overwhelming amount of data that link the importance of reducing highly lethal means to save lives from suicide. And I initially thought David misspoke um, when he mentioned that in the Australia gun buyback program, which we talked about on the show last week, it didn't result in a reduction in suicide and suicide in Australia kept rising. So I went back and double checked, checked the data and he was kind of both right and wrong. Um, the RAND Corporation, you know, did a meta analysis of all the studies and their conclusion was, you know, the strongest evidence is consistent with the claims, I'm quoting them, that the National Firearms Act caused reduction in firearm suicides. So suicides by mm. firearm reduced significantly. Then so I, then I went and said, OK, so what about overall suicides? Overall suicides uh, shortly after the Firearm Act went down and then started going up again and have been roughly even in Australia for the last you know, 20 or 30 years without a whole lot of variation. So it is both true to say um, the firearm buyback in Australia reduced gun suicides dramatically, had a medium term reduction on overall suicides, but people apparently I mean, suicide is so dependent on so many things, you know, mental health, uh, social trends, social networking, you know, that it's hard to say, well, if there weren't any guns, no one could, would commit suicide. No, people do find ways to commit suicide. Um, mm -hmm. But it's it's so he was kind of right and also kind of a little bit not right. But it, correct mm -hmm. me, Phil, though, wasn't the the Australian law limited to like assault rifles? It was specific kinds of guns. It took about 20% of privately owned guns off the streets and, and a, wow. um, saw a reduction in firearm suicides of almost 50%. So, you know, taking 20% of the guns in a, in a focused way, you know, and it was also high capacity magazines and assault rifles. And I think there were some new, new handgun laws. It was, a, it was a pretty wide ranging group of regulations. So there seems to be a fair amount of evidence that certain types of gun death decreased significantly in Australia by taking just 20% of the, the privately owned firearms off the street. It did not end up uh, reducing suicide rates long term, but people can find a way, I guess, is what you learn from that. Um, so the I, next... I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no, you go. You. I didn't know if you were going to go to other objections because I didn't know if the objections yes. that were lodged were very specific or were they more uh, about the some, some were of the general, claims he was making? Um, some were general the, of 
felt that he was hiding too much behind the Constitution. It was like, well, we can't do anything because the Constitution, Constitution mm. says. Mm -hmm. um, it, and that's, you know, an interesting argument because obviously we've changed the Constitution before. There are these things what? we call... Um, things we call amendments. What? Mike. Well, and amendments. the other piece of that, and he tried to he tried to make the case that unlike abortion which he would say is an unenumerated right that's not really in the constitution that mm -hmm. is inappropriate gun ownership is an enumerated right in the second amendment and so it sets it up differently i don't buy that argument because the, although the second amendment says that the the rights to own a gun should not be infringed it's in the broader context of because of a well the need for a well regulated militia so i would uh, argue unless it, it, uh, unless on, you're on. listening this, to scalia I, well, his whole argument, and so was Scalia's, by the way, their whole argument is that there is throughout English history of law, a right for personal defense. I agree. There is certainly a right of personal defense in American in history and, and English history, but that is an unenumerated right. It's not in the constitution. Nowhere in the constitution does it say that you have a personal right to self-defense with a firearm. That's inferred. It's not actually articulated. So I still say it's an unenumerated right. And the Second Amendment, it's a, I'd argue, is a very long stretch to get there, but that's what they do. So I don't see yeah. it being any different than any other unenumerated right, which can be regulated and amended if necessary by the Constitution. Yeah. And that's where, uh, because what happened in, in the 90s with Scalia writing the opinion, I think it was the Heller case. That was 2008. That, that, 2008. Oh, 2008. Yeah. yeah. That the, the stuff about militia is just preamble. It has nothing to do with the Second Amendment. Mm. Okay. Mm. Can I can I unpack this for a second? Because I've actually been doing a lot of reading and studying on exactly oh, this Oh, and issue. engaging yeah. people on that. Twitter about this. Yes, I have. I couldn't help but notice. <laughs> so the frequent <laughs> argument you hear is that the Second Amendment was written to arm the citizens so that they could be a deterrent to the tyranny of the government. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right and in Canada. Right. And <laughs> James Madison actually t wrote about this in Federalist Number Forty Six. Oh, and I don't, come on. I, I don't have Bring any friends, but that's what people people will always cite Federalist Forty Six and James Madison and the tyranny of government and the arming of the people and all that as the whole motivation behind the Second Amendment. But what James Madison actually says is that the state governments having the right to form militias would be a deterrent on the federal government gaining too much power. And did so if you take that? it... What, what's that? Did he say that? Really? He did say Is that. that. Literally what he said? Yeah. Well, I don't... You want me to pull it up? Do you want to pause this and me pull it up? No, but we'll all look it up. And we'll, we'll, okay. we'll link it, look it we'll up. link it in the show notes so that the we can power verify... Of the states. Whether a liberal sky is just telling us his own little fantasy new version of Federalist Paper number whatever. 46. The, 46. Power of the, state, the power of the states to raise militias would be a deterrent on the federal government to gaining too much power. And the way the states raise militias was by calling people, men, farmers, to bring their, bring muskets, their muskets to form a militia. So the way mm -hmm. a militia was armed 200 years ago was the same way that a farm was armed 200 years ago. It's just muskets. But what's interesting is if that's really the argument that individual citizens were supposed to be the combatants against the federal government, then why has the Supreme Court, including in Heller, argued that there is no constitutional right for an individual citizen to have military weaponry? The reason is because the way mm. state militias or state national guards are now armed is with military weaponry. Most states have military weapons at their disposal for their national guards. Mm -hmm. They no longer ask individual citizens, hey, will you join our militia and please bring your gun? Because they have military weapons. An individual's gun is going to be no threat to the federal army. Mm -hmm. So this, this is kind of a bogus argument. The Constitution never intended for individuals to fight the federal government. It intended for states to be armed against the federal government. And we have that today, and they use military weapons. So this idea that it's individual rights to bear arms against the tyranny, that's completely bogus and ridiculous. Does that make any I don't sense? Think Illinois has any submarines. 
No, we but are, we do have we are hopefully <laughs> unprepared to take on the federal government. <laughs> but does is it, it does it matter that those state militias are nationalized? Uh, I think since the Civil War, that's been the model because what happened in the Civil War is state militias essentially band together in the South and went to war against the federal government and they got killed. They got crushed. So right. that balance of power shifted completely after the Civil War. Mm. And Madison's original argument doesn't really hold up anymore because that's what was tried. The states tried to keep the federal government in check and the federal government won. So I'm not sure it applies anymore. But mm. again... It, if, and I got an interesting Twitter conversation with a guy this week about it. He was arguing that individual citizens must be armed to fight the federal government. And I said, okay, then why aren't we allowed to have military weapons? Why can't I have an F-15? Why can't I have nuclear weapons? Why can't I have artillery and mm -hmm. tanks? And the Supreme Court throughout its history has always argued, well, you have no right to those weapons as an individual. Why mm -hmm. not? And he said, well, the Supreme Court's wrong. And I'm saying is, you actually believe that individuals should have all the, and, and, and he dropped the conversation after that. But that's the mm -hmm. only logical conclusion. If the intent of the Second Amendment was for the individual to be able to fight the federal government, then we should have the same weapons as the federal government. And no Supreme Court has ever said that's what it meant. Wow. Okay. Can I move on to the next objection? Totally. Well, hold on. We haven't dealt fully with what? Palatine's what? Order 66. <laughs> And I think there's a lot that is brought to bear here too, but okay, we can move on. So we should Mike. all have lightsabers to protect ourselves. I mean, I'm just saying, I mean, that's the, Mike. that's the, that's mm -hmm. the, I mean, if we're going to fight the empire, dog But on only, it. only the federal government can have double bladed lightsabers because <laughs> that's military issue. After another feedback, after listening to this podcast, I have two questions for David about his position on the right to self-defense. Assuming that mm -hmm. defending ourselves is a basic human right, does it follow that having a gun is the only way to effectively exercise that right? It seems that there would be other methods such as tasers or pepper spray that would be almost as effective in most circumstances and would not result in the death of the assailant. Second question, I'm wondering where the right to lethal self-defense is found in the New Testament. And that's why we brought Mike on, because he's an expert <laughs> in New Testament. He's a pastor. Sky's an mm. ex-pastor. Uh, uh, <laughs> Mike is a well, current pastor. So, my, I mean, my response is I assume where people go is Luke twenty two thirty six? Jesus said to his disciples as he was sending them out, if you have a purse, take it and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy a sword. Or you're going to get men should taken... have purses. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's it's very true. That's or that's, that, that's true. or you're going to be so, consistent. So a European Jesus... carry all. OK, guys, guys, stay with what? me. You okay. two bald people. Oh. Jesus said you need to have a sword to defend yourself while you're doing God's work. Yes or no? <laughs> that's why gonna... Mike packs heat in the pulpit. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Mike, is, Mike is hot in the pulpit. That's very true. Um, so I'm going to go with false, Alex, for 4,000 points. <laughs> okay. Okay, why? One. Why? You got to sell me on it. You can't just say it. Well, you know, it's this wonderful thing that we do as Americans where we love reading the Bible as if it were a flat document without context, as if it were um, uh, something that was written to us uh, directly ad addressing modern concerns. And so we yank a verse like this out of context. And then it's fascinating because I was looking at the passages um, independently of this conversation. And um, in each case, Jesus ties the sword thing to fulfillment of, of prophecy. And, in, and, and as Luke goes on, um, uh, he says, if you have a purse, uh, take it. Also a bag. If you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. And then he quotes Old Testament. It is written, he was numbered with the transgressor transgressors and I tell you, this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what was written is about me is fulfilling or is reaching its fulfillment. The disciples said, see, Lord, here are two swords. And that's enough, he says 
emphatically. So the swords were not for self-defense, even remotely. Or, this was Jesus being aware of the prophetic film and as he is throughout the entire crucifixion story of all of the things that are happening around him that were foretold earlier in the scriptures. So, so the stretch of, hey, he told his disciples to get a sword, guys, means we can have guns is not it's ridiculous exegetically um but it also betrays kind of a modern hermeneutic that americans employ to justify things that i think jesus clearly speaks against so mike one of the interpretations i heard which i think you might be alluding to here is that jesus is foreshadowing his own arrest and the mock trial that's going to happen in his in his crucifixion and part of what he does to kind of ensure the outcome that he knows needs to happen is by his little group of buddies there having a couple of swords on them. Yeah. They could be accused of being a military threat, of being a, a violent insurrection, which would then provoke Roman authorities to justify capital punishment for their leader. Right. So yeah, the oh. Jesus was pur purposely provoking. Absolutely. Exactly. So he wasn't intending them to use the swords. He was intending them That's just right. to have them so that when the accusation is made that he's a political threat, the Romans right. could say, yes, yeah, see, he and the Jews could say he actually had weapons. Therefore, he deserves the death penalty. It's a way of Jesus provoking the authorities to put him on the cross. And he and does we're this supposed other to places. do that, too. We're supposed to follow in his footsteps. <laughs> so we need to be armed so we can provoke the authorities. Yes, I think that be is Christ the natural. Like. Christ-likeness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but no. it, it's fascinating. The, um, you know, the, the, the text that Jesus is referring to is Isaiah 53 with him being numbered among the rebels um, and, and named among the sinners. And so, Sky, I think you're absolutely right. And, and this isn't just something we're reading into it. I mean, Jesus specifically attaches... What he's just asked the disciples to do to the fulfillment of Scripture, and it's hinted at in um, in Luke, uh, excuse me, in Matthew and Mark as well that he's he's operating in a way so that Scripture might be fulfilled. So and, it is it is a massive stretch to that. Yeah, and then in the account of Jesus' arrest, Matthew twenty six makes this explicit. Peter takes one of those swords and he attacks one of the guards that's arresting Jesus famously cuts off his ear and Jesus rebukes Peter and says, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Yes. And then picks up that severed ear and heals the guard. Yeah. He heals this man. So there you have, if you really want to believe that Jesus intended his followers to be armed, if he did, he certainly didn't intend us to use those arms. <laughs> well, you, you just, again, uh, it, it's, it's what we do as American sky and you're dead on as always. I will come on and agree with you anytime. That's why you're here, just to you know, be a yes man for us. <laughs> yes, talk yes. up. No, I, I, I absolutely think where we get uh, a positive use of sword from this is a total violation to the entire text and the story you just brought up, which is, and and then the 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 phrase that is enough when they say, hey, we have two swords. Um, meaning that he was not literally in any way, shape, or form, meaning this as a as a legitimate form of self-defense. This was all we need to do is provoke the authorities. That's plenty. Okay. Okay, but Mike, to, to picture, Phil's then, earlier is yeah, is there no basis for self-defense in the Bible? Well, it depends how you frame it, because if we're talking about rights, then I would say no. There's absolutely no right to self-defense in the New Testament. It's fascinating. French wrote an article on his Sunday, his Sunday uh, newsletter, and he referred to the biblical and a previous article he had written called "The Biblical and Natural Right of Self-Defense." And so I read through it, and the ar argument, as far as I could tell, and again, French is so much smarter than me. You know, I hesitate even calling into question. But the argument consisted of a bunch of Old Testament passages, shocking, with some explaining away of New Testament passages. And I just think that's a precisely wrong order and approach to take a, to ask about whether or not um, self-defense is permitted in the scripture. Jesus, what Jesus does in the Sermon on the Mount, as he takes um, what were considered to be either oral traditions or misinterpretations of, of Hebrew teaching, and then speaks as an authority over those and against those, particularly the eye for eye one, 
I, I'm not sure how confidently we can generate a right to self-defense out of that, particularly if we understand the invitation of Jesus to adopt the cruciform way of life, the renunciation of our rights and, and for the self-expenditure of others. Now, that that doesn't answer the question whether or not, you know, um, violence is ever justified to restrict harm. I get that. But it certainly doesn't give us a positive argument in any way, shape, or form that this is some right that's permitted in the Bible. I think, I think, yeah, go ahead, Sky. I'm, um, I'm not here to quote passage and verse, but can you make the case? Wow. So you and I are, are both fans of, and Phil is too, fans may be the wrong word, but um, we've been influenced deeply by Dallas Willard and his teaching and, and expounding of scripture. And he talk, he defines the biblical call to love as to will the good of another. Yeah. Right? Yep. I can imagine a scenario in which somebody is actively harming me. Mm -hmm. And rather than acting out of a a self-defense posture that's rooted in my rights, I could act to defend myself in a way which is actually most loving to the person who is assaulting me. Meaning, Mm -hmm. um, I want to do what's best for this other person, and what's best for them is to stop them from Mm -hmm. this act of harm on me, not Mm -hmm. just because it protects me, but because it's actually what's best for them as well. Mm -hmm. So can that be an argument for self-defense where it's not rooted in my rights, but it's rooted in love for the other who is actually unknowingly harming themselves through their own actions? Sure. But how do you draw those lines? I mean, if we grant the theoretic yes, theoretical yes, then, then how does that go? Like we had this guy... Uh, my daughter was playing lacrosse and we had this guy hop a fence. He was bleeding all up and down his arm. Young kid, no shirt. And the game stops and he he uh, a trainer runs out to check on him and he tackles the trainer and begins to punch her. I run out um, with great speed like a gazelle amongst the lilies. <laughs> and um, I jump on this dude and restrain him. I don't punch him. I don't kick him. I restrain him. Right. There's a difference there between using force and using violence in my mind. And so was I helping him? Yes. He was going to harm himself. Um, Absolutely. So I think there is an ethic there, but I think that, that there's a step beyond that, that whatever it is to restrain, whatever, whatever, you know, whatever it takes to restrain violence in that moment um, is different than uh, what it would be to actively harm him. Now, the, there comes a point when harming may be the only way to restrain. I get that. But there does seem like there, there in some circumstances, is a whole lot of gray area till we get to that point. And so, yeah, I, I have a much easier time building a biblical case for the defense of others, defense of the innocent. Absolutely. Right? Yes. yes. Than, I, than I do self-defense. So yes. I'm trying to imagine yes. a scenario in which self-defense is actually loving toward the other rather yes. than just self-preservation. What about the command yeah. to provide for your family? Does, is security one of the things we're supposed to provide for our families? I Anyone so. who does not provide for his relatives, especially for members of his household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Someone's out to get my children. I need to stop them. Or I'm worse than an unbeliever. Where's I mean, my assault rifle? <laughs> Again, that's a great text pulled out of context, but he's dealing with people who are um, allowing widows to be on the widows list when they, in fact, could take care of them, but they didn't want to because... Uh, they wanted to hoard their own resources. So this You're saying this, it only applies to widows? It doesn't apply to children who are being <laughs> stalked? Well, I'm just saying it's an economic, it's an economic argument that Okay. Um, I'm just saying if you wanna if you wanna build the case, then build the case without having to pull scriptures that aren't dealing exactly well, with the circumstances that we're know the If you're going to know the context of every verse I pull out, <laughs> it makes it really hard for me, and I resent that, and I don't think it's Christian. I, I think I think Sky's on to something, though. Sky, if I can just like say, uh, affirm, that the biblical case for the protection of others, now I think we're cooking. Um, I think you can make that positive biblical case. The best you can do, I think, 
on the right to self-defense is to make the negative case that the Bible doesn't prohibit it. But I don't think you can say it, it encourages it as a posture we're to have um, uh, as, as uh, Jesus followers. So what I would disagree with French, at least in his article, is the, the use of the word right. I don't think we have a right to self-defense. I think we've given up that right by becoming cruciform people. Now, that may be we expend our lives in service to others, right? Absolutely. But to simply, to simply justify lethal arms using that idea stretches the text way beyond what would ever have been intended by its original authors. Totally. I agree. All right, buddy. Go ahead. Who, me? What? Who? Uh, no, Sky. I interrupted Who's Sky. Who's going ahead? Oh, Sky. Sky. Go ahead, Sky. Take us, take I, us I, home. Take us I home. Think the other text that, I think the other text that's relevant here, which gets abused a lot, is Romans 13. And the oh. idea that God has given governmental authorities the sword in right. order to punish evildoers, as some translations would put it. Yeah. Which implies that part of the role of of godly government is the protection of the people from evil. Yeah. And I think that's where our American government is failing us in this moment, is we are failing to create a society of general safety for the public by allowing 400 million guns to be unregulated and floating through the population in the name of creating a safe country. So, right, because we need 401 million guns and the million are in the hands of all the teachers so they can stop the crazy people. Yeah. So, and that was another, honestly, and I've interacted with David French since that episode was recorded privately about this because it raised more questions for me. He, If you recall, he made the case that one of the reasons that the police officers did not go in and stop this shooting in Texas is because they weren't trained well enough to combat this kind of thing. Well, yeah, well, they, they're not, not that they're not trained well, but they're not trained for that situation. Right, they're for trained, that situation. Trained, and it was an interesting argument. He says most American police officers are trained for self-preservation. They're not right. trained to put, the, to put their lives on, you know, on the line to save someone else. That's what the military is trained for. And then he brought up the example of the Philando Castile shooting in which a a police officer shot an unarmed motorist after he was pulled over. And, and one of the explanations that David French has given for this, you know, terrible scourge of police shooting of unarmed, especially black men, is that police are being given more and more lethal weapons and they are being trained and taught to be more and more fearful of everyone that they encounter. So you've lowered the bar for fear and you've raised the, the lethal outcome of being afraid. And what's what struck me about his argument, and then he said, we need better training of police officers to, to deal with that. I'm going, but well, then why are we arming American citizens with no training at all with lethal weapons, while at the same time, we're creating a culture that's increasingly distrustful of one another, more paranoid, more fearful, mm. and that's not a recipe for disaster. So mm. if he thinks that we need more training for police officers, I would argue then we at least need minimal training and screening for citizens who are mm. being given these weapons as well. Mm. So I, I think it's a self-defeating argument. I think the idea that we need more guns because there's so many guns already to make us safer is being proven to be utterly false. And mm. it's a mutually assured destruction on the cultural level that is unsustainable. And I suspect, based on what he wrote on, on his um, weekly newsletter, I think David is beginning to lay the groundwork for maybe rethinking his position here. And I'd love to talk to him more about it. I don't think he's going to do a 180 or, or totally agree with my point of view, but I think even he is realizing that the situation with guns in this country is unsustainable and there have to be better solutions than even just red flag laws. Right. And see, this is where the church, if it's truly the church, should step in and um, and not fall prey to just the partisanship and policy discussions, but but the Church of Jesus in its earliest iterations provided a set of moral imagining that just was beyond the normal ways of human life, and that's what's missing, right? Because we've been in the church so politicized, and you can just track. Whenever a shooting happens, all of the comments you know that are coming and the counter arguments and all those sorts of things from Christians or non-Christians alike. And even, I mean, the number of pastors I've talked to where I'm like, hey, could you talk about guns? Could you talk about guns in your church? And the answer is no. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And um, and then you're like, well, then we've identified an idol, correct? And and so what's lost is any any um, a moral imagining that would have both you know gun banners and gun keepers at the table that allows us to work through solutions that you know don't trans that that don't just fall prey to the partisan divide. So I I think there's at least in the Christian settings, I think there's a massive failure of discipleship that goes along with this. Um, it like so many other ways is just being revealed uh, by the conversations we're able to have or unable to have around this topic. And so I love, for me, it's not just a position of, well, what policies are effective? It's how do, how are Christians invited to see the world? Is the world a place where we are horrified and self-preservation is the greatest value? And the answer is no, there is not. We are, I mean, that, that's just contrary to the whole thing that Jesus was up to. And so for me, I, I park that conversation way back to say, is the world, I mean, another thing that Willard says that's so challenging to me is he just has this line where he says, we are safe in God's good world. And the fact that I don't believe that mm-hmm. um, speaks a lot about the a moral imagination I've kind of inherited, you know? Mm-hmm. So I, Boy. I don't want to just come at it. Um, although, man, I mean, you guys, I love the debates because I'm hearing things I didn't realize or know. But there's also the pastor in me also wants to say, man, there is a there is a crippling way that Christians have been taught to look at the world that plays directly into the energy around this discussion that I would want to address to. Yeah. Okay. And then there's that, always... Okay, hold on. Yeah, okay. Even yeah. That, that was a great point. I, I agree. <laughs> that was a I horrible point. No, I agree with you. I agree no, with I just, you. I just, I want to clarify I'm, what yeah, okay meant because, because it, it's okay. I mean, I'm, I make bad points all the time. I feel that was agree. verbally ambiguous. That- <laughs> <laughs> nice pullback. We were nice discussing guy. before we started recording that Sky is ethnically ambiguous and Mike wants, for some reason, wants to be considered ethically ambiguous and I am yes. verbally ambiguous. <laughs> That's great. I do always yeah. want okay. to raise the question, why when it comes to abortion, do we have policy ideas? And when it comes to gun violence, we have <laughs> thoughts and prayers. And that's oh, it's all so good. we've got. Can't we have thoughts and prayers for any death or tragic event and ideas for how to move our feet and our hands to do something about it? But Phil, or prayers don't that work. we'll get ideas for how to do something about it, Sky. Laws don't work, Phil. Don't. Remember? You can't don't legislate even. against evil, guys. Yeah, we I'm sorry. don't. Don't even. Can't do that. Don't start. So was, yeah. What? But you're right. If, if we really, if you want to go with that crazy argument that laws don't work and you can't legislate morality, then why don't we take that same posture towards abortion? Because it's wrong. <laughs> right. There you go. Um, yeah. I, the whole prayers, thoughts and prayers. I was actually tweeting about this earlier today. Um, there's nice. this implied criticism that prayer is the opposite of action. Mm-hmm. And that's, yeah, that's not true. correct. Prayer is the opposite of apathy. And if you're mm-hmm. using thoughts and prayers as a way of not acting, then that's you're it. doing it wrong. That's you're not, not praying. It. That's not. That's what praying. people object to. That's right. Right. So uh, the the call is yes, we should be people of prayer, clearly, and in our prayer, we ought to be guided and empowered by the presence of God to act. Yes. Prayer Period. is a form of co-partnership with God in his exactly. work in the world. That's yes. right. So if this is a problem that human agency can move the needle on, Come then on. we ought to prayerfully act to move that needle. But it can't because Constitution. <laughs> Which was written by people and can be no. amended by people. <laughs> I saw a picture of it's... Jesus handing it to Thomas Jefferson. Well, uh, you know what? Then it shouldn't say we the people in the first line. It should it should say I Jesus Christ, but it doesn't. It says we the people. Yeah, well, that was a mistake on Jesus's part, obviously. <laughs> so okay, uh, Mike, thanks for sitting in today. It was awesome. Oh, you guys are great. Hey, if you like Mike, if you like Mike, well, he no, has his own podcast, no. Voxology, <laughs> Voxology. Uh, dot com is it? Do you have Voxology? No, Voxology, Voxology Podcast. Voxology Podcast. Podcast. Com, baby. 
voxologypodcast.com or just look for voxology podcast wherever fine podcasts yeah. are listened are to and well, we'll try yes. to have you back before too long well we're thinking about renaming it the holy most yeah <laughs> and yeah um, sure so you may want to keep a lookout for that i'm not sure hey sure are we uh, gonna, we but we could have a show where where popular evangelical <laughs> pastors talk about their latest accomplishments called the Holy Boast. Ooh. <laughs> or we could we could bring in we could bring in comedians and just make fun of people and call it the Holy Roast. Oh, I kind of like that good. idea. Yeah, that's good. Scott. Yeah. Uh, speaking of all these uh, new things, uh, <laughs> Phil, you and I, I think we're supposed to talk about some new merchandise that we've just. Oh. Are we? rolled out Are yeah we? yeah is it out there's some new it's our 10th anniversary um mike did you know yes. that it's our 10th anniversary i did i did in and 500th so episode yes do it yeah and we're doing some 10th anniversary merchandise so go to the holypost.com and you can see the 10th anniversary merchandise exclusive limited edition it will not be on sale forever collect it now trade with your friends show up at school with the latest styles be the first on your block and then you can wholly boast about it to your friends you sell, and neighbors. You could sell bread and call it holy toast. Yeah, okay. I mean, I can keep I think, going all day. I think you I went too far. I keep going all day. Uh, no, you can form I don't, an island and call no. it the holy coast. I know. I don't know. <laughs> go down the alphabet. No. I'm keep going. No. Stop. <laughs> holy Faust. Okay. Uh, thanks, Mike Erie. Thanks, Guy Jutani. Thanks, all you listeners, for supporting us on Patreon and for showing up every week. And we will be back next week with a different special guest who is oh. just, just as smart and good looking as Mike Erie, but has a way better laugh. So you can, you can try to figure out who that is and come back next week. And we will see you next time. Thanks, y'all. The Holy Post is brought to you by our listeners who support us on Patreon. This episode is also sponsored by our friends at Faithful Counseling. This is Phil. My wife Lisa and I got married young and we were a little bit immature. One of our parents gave us as a wedding gift a year of counseling. At first I thought, wait, what are you saying about my mental health? But the ability to talk to a counselor as issues came up in our lives and in our relationship was a huge help. Faithful Counseling is a Christian counseling service with more than 3,000 licensed therapists across all 50 states with access by video or phone sessions or even chat and text. With expertise in depression, stress, anxiety, trauma, family conflicts, and more, you can ask for a new counselor at any time and financial aid is available for those who qualify. Best of all, Holy Post listeners get 10% off your first month month from our sponsor, Faithful Counseling. So what do you got to lose? Give it a try. Go to faithfulcounseling.com slash holy post. Just fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and you'll get matched with a counselor you'll love. That's faithfulcounseling.com slash holy post. And now back to the show. Deconstruction has become a very popular and much debated topic among Christians today. For those who grew up in the evangelical subculture, many are questioning the beliefs and practices they've inherited from that subculture. Some critics of deconstruction say it's a dangerous trajectory fueled by a culture that's questioning everything about faith and Christianity. But then there are others who believe that deconstruction is ultimately a healthy practice that helps us discern the difference between true faith in Christ and simply cultural frameworks that we've inherited. And then there are those who see deconstruction as a natural response to a sometimes toxic and unhealthy evangelical church subculture. I put my guest today into that third category. Lena Abujamra is a pediatric ER physician who has spent a number of years on staff at a megachurch here in the Chicago area. When that church and its leadership imploded with significant scandals and a broken trust, it sent her into a season of significantly doubting her faith. The result of that season is her new book, Fractured Faith, Finding Your Way Back to God in an Age of Deconstruction. She came out of it with a faith that was actually stronger than before, and the wisdom that she's gained is now being shared with others who are finding themselves in a season where they are questioning everything. My conversation with her covers all kinds of topics from toxic church leadership to missed expectations to a proper view of discipleship. And what does it mean to really own our responsibility for our own questions and doubts? 
I hope you find this conversation helpful, and I have no doubt that you will find Lena to be both passionate and energetic about this topic. It's evident that she cares deeply about those who are going through this kind of deconstruction season, but she also wants you to know that there's hope, that you don't have to come out of it without faith. In fact, you might come out of it with a faith that's even stronger than when you went in. Here is my conversation with Lena Abu Jamra. Lena, welcome to the Holy Post. It's so good to be here. You guys are famous. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we we have grown a little bit, and we are grateful to have great guests on like you. Uh, your book is called Fractured Faith, Finding Your Way Back to God in an Age of Deconstruction. You were brought to my awareness by my friend Drew Dick from Moody Publishing, who recommend we do a segment with him pretty regularly where he tells us about books that he's reading. And he had read your book, and he was raving about it. So I picked up the book. It is excellent. I'm delighted to have you here to talk about it. Um, Obviously, deconstruction is a popular hot topic. Everyone seems to be deconstructing something these days. But your story is important because I think it taps into where a lot of people who are going through a season of deconstruction begin, which is a significant crisis triggered by church failure. Fill us in a little bit. I mean, we can't get into the excruciating details here, but some of your journey in church leadership that brought you to that dark night of the soul, that deconstructing season of your life. Right. Yeah. I mean, nobody wishes that in their Christian life, but about 2010, I was attending a big church in Chicago where I live and things started to, there was a lot of signs of infection. Should we call it that? As a physician, I guess I could use some of these analogies, but basically it was evident there was something wrong with the leadership structure. And, you know, for two to three years, I watched it unfold and prayerfully sort of thought about what was the right thing and sort of gave the leadership the benefit of the doubt. But things only got louder the, the closer it got to 2013, which is when I eventually walked away from the church. And it was really tragic because even looking back, I think like, why are th- these things, why do churches implode? And I think it's, it's not sudden. It happens over time. And so for me, basically, I tried my best to stay in the... I was working at the church. In fact, I was practicing medicine in the pediatric ER, and I was running um, the women's ministry at this big church. And so I was very vested. I was very much on the inside circle, sort of. If you looked at the, a lot of these mega churches have tiers of you know, getting closer and closer to the pastor. I would say I was very, very close to the pastor. And uh, and for whatever reason, I mean, I, how, how that all worked out. But to the point where I, I was vested in trying to stay, but the evidence became so powerful against any kind of accountability in the leadership, causing hurt to many. And then things started happening that I just couldn't in good conscience like, be like, I'm going to stay here and accept this. And so I left and I knew leaving, it wouldn't be easy because I was so close to the inner circle. And I, I, I had seen how the pattern of when people would leave, how they would be treated. So I was aware enough. I had been in the faith already for much of my life. I mean, I was already now in what my 40, early 40s, and I had been a Christian as a child growing up in Lebanon. And so I wasn't new to the faith. I wasn't new to church problems, but this was a different caliber because this pastor was very well known. And because as I chose to leave and sort of looked at the evidence and decided that those who are speaking against the leadership were right, I realized that nothing immediately bad happened to the leadership structure. So now you sort of make the statement by leaving of saying, I don't agree with what's happening. And you sort of anticipate because you've been prayerful about these things and you're trying to do the right thing. You're hoping that God will sort of make everybody see that indeed what I've seen is common to everyone. But it yeah, was- if I can interrupt you, I want to quote you from your own book here because I think you say it really well. This is in the introduction, page 17. In those early days, I believed God would step in and do something dramatic to make everything right that. And it's like, I didn't expect much from man. I mean, I'm cynical enough to believe that we are like all broken, but I thought like God would do something with what was clearly a sinful pattern of behavior. And, and it didn't change for years, six years. It, it looked as if they were all, they meaning it, it becomes an us versus them. As much as you don't want it to be that, it looked like they were succeeding and flourishing and growing and all these parameters that we've hold so valuable. And I started the path in what is now I can look back and refer to as the dark night of the soul. And at the time we didn't have these words that we do now, which is really, I entered a seer, a seer, a season, I should say of deconstruction. Now I can give it that label. I don't know that I had that label before. I would have described it as extremely painful, unmooring things that I thought were just, 
just standard knowledge about church and how Christians should behave and function and leadership and example. And it just all sort of cracked. And, and I, I don't never stopped believing that God existed, that Jesus had died for the sins of mankind. I mean, those were not the type of beliefs that I questioned, but I certainly had a very hard time relating to God when the example of leadership who I completely respected, admired, admired for so long, had betrayed me so bad. Like humanly, I was betrayed. And now it felt as if God was on the side of this pastor. And so it put me in a place where I really, really struggled to hold on to the faith for some time. Okay. So when I've had conversations with some guests on our show, but just outside of it as well, about deconstruction, and I'm using air quotes, um, you can put people in sort of two categories who are going through this process. This may be an oversimplification. There are some people who begin to question their faith and what they were taught or whatever because of the influence coming outside the church. The culture, they're exposed to ideas or people or values that they were not familiar with, and it makes them question a lot of things. In my experience, that's the minority of people who are deconstructing. The other category are people who are second-guessing their faith and their teachings and whatever because they've had profoundly painful experiences inside the church. So we want to make the culture into the boogeyman all the time, but I kind of think that deconstruction is a phenomenon that's born out of toxic church experiences. It sounds like what you experienced. Yeah, hundred percent. I agree with you, and I don't think it's an oversimplification. I like oversimplifications, but really, it is true. I've I've summed it up to saying the one common thread of deconstruction is this element of deep pain, and pain is grown out of being wounded. And the biggest wounding is from people that you expect the least to hurt you. And I think people of faith, people you look up to, people that have controlled your spiritual emotion, so to speak. You know, you go to church, you, an invitation is given, a challenge to change at the root of core of who you are. Now they're the ones who betray you. And when you leave, they don't even come knocking after you. I think that's the other thing. Honestly, I think right now, like the, the entire dramatical shift in church attendance and church um, connection that we're seeing, which has immense ramifications on people. I genuinely believe so much of the increased anxiety and mental health and and loneliness and all if, if I would even move to say that then drives this the sin that that follows is like whether it's how do you you know numb those feelings of pain that you have well now you can get into the entire addictive ways that we soothe that pain which can range from anything from overeating to to sex you know whatever however to to other means i mean to even just closing yourself off from human kind as a whole like i think i found that people's side effects of that pain is so widespread right now. So we can look at a church and go, man, much less people go to church and people are hurting. But if you don't make the connection, that is because people just stop trusting the church. That's the problem. And not just the church, the leaders. I think we've got a huge leadership crisis in the United States of America, evangelical church in particular, but I would say the church as a whole. But I think the evangelical church is now, the spotlight is on us. I would say. Yes. Okay. Let's put a pin in that because I want to come back to it before we're done. But back up a little bit because earlier you said a word that occurs a lot in your book and a significant section of your book is about this, and that is expectations. Yeah. Um, I I think this is underreported in this whole conversation around deconstruction. You... You talk about how your expectations of the leaders you worked with, of the church you were a part of, but not just that, even of Christianity itself, of the tenets of the faith, that your expectations were proven to be uh, off target as you went through this season. Talk about some of the expectations that you received in your formation in the church that you now look back on and realize those were false. They were wrong. I think at the core of of an idea that I was brought up with was the, and sort of weighs into the whole debate that we see now with purity culture, but this idea that if I do my part, God will do his. Mm. And in that sentence, and I've I've seen it play out, by the way, in every one of the books that I've written, I've hinted to that in singleness. Like if if I stay pure, God will provide me the perfect husband. I'm single to this day. You know, on and on, we apply it in many ways, but there is this sense of, you just obey, and if you obey, good things will happen to you. And they don't have to be a lot of money. We're not, God forbid, we're not prosperity preachers, right? And so we don't believe that. But there is an undercurrent of 
Everything will line up eventually. And honestly, it's unfair because I don't think the Bible really teaches that in the short run. I mean, it does teach that things will work out in the end, but there's like an 80-year span where things might be really bad. And for Jesus, it was only 33 years. And so I think, you know, somehow, even if it's not uttered that way, there's an example laid out. And I think in the last 10 years in the United States with the megachurch movement, we have seen that on steroids modeled. And in fact, I went to a church where the leader would say healthy things grow. And that is simply not true. Well, I mean, you're, just, you're a physician. Cancer grows. Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> it's you not healthy. Apply, it's, it was, but, you, but you're so brainwashed a degree that you just nod your head and you look in your life, you start squaring off the parameters. And this is where I think culture plays a part because I think churches and churches that have grown strategic, you know, worldly culture and worldly ideas have definitely impacted the way we do church and what we consider successful. And, you know, obviously the American dream has seeped into the church and, and, and I think that's played into our politics and church and our entire, you know, dynamic of, of, and, and that can, I mean, again, that can play out to an extreme prosperity gospel or a much more subtle one, which was what I grew up in. So another way of putting this is if we, I mean, I'm assuming we're fairly close in age. I'm in my mid to late forties now. Um, if you've spent decades like we have in Christian communities and in the church, and your expectations are really off target, they're not aligned with scripture, aren't what isn't what we're talking about here just a basic failure of discipleship? Oh, that's uh I, I don't think we're I don't think we're discipling much anymore at all. I mean, think about the way we do discipleship now. It's so funny. I, I read recently an article that was doubting the value of small groups and but the entire model, I, I was even critical of that when I was in the mega church and leading the women's ministry, sort of overseeing small group. I, I I'm sorry, but I tend to be a bit of a critic of the small group model because you've got to you know, you jump in a bunch of people that know no one another and the guy you know, the guy or the gal whoever's leading the small group is technically supposed to oversee their discipleship process, because outside of that, you've got literally a 25-minute message that's supposed to disciple you, right? I mean, so I think the way that we've, so I think that small group model is largely there to assuage the guilt of the mega church movement, which is basically, you've got these 30 minutes to get people in the door and keep them in the door, and then your small group becomes the place where you're supposed to become a disciple. But who, I mean, very few, who can really say that small group has really shaped me and formed me into to be, being the disciple that I am? And, and I honestly, See, I think our life experiences are, I, I would even say our suffering and our p- painful places are, are one of our bigger disciplers, but we don't understand that going into it. We don't, not just do we not understand it, there's something in us that doesn't w- want that. And maybe we are let, like, sort of confused in that. But after I've gone through suffering and I've seen its powerful discipling means I've been able to go, my gosh, of course, this is what the psalmist says. Like he was happy with tribulation, not because he was happy with tribulation, but because he saw the fruit of it. And and you look at the New Testament and James and, you know, talks about suffering in that fashion. And I just don't think that's genuinely taught. I'm not saying you can't be a disciple without suffering, but I see how expectation, going back to that word that I think you're right. I do believe that word has to be understood and and in many ways destroyed because I genuinely believe that if we had biblical expectations, we wouldn't walk around disappointed in our Christianity, which is where many of us have lived. So it sounds to me, if I'm hearing you correctly, that we there's kind of a, a, a perfect storm that's leading to deconstruction and disillusionment. And that is, we're shaped by an American culture and society with a whole lot of expectations that are not biblical, including the ones that if I do my part, God will do his and my life will be defined by success as I've come to define that from American culture. So we bring all that into the church. That's error number one. Error number two, then, is the church, at least many churches, does very little to correct that error. And perhaps the icing on the cake, the third great error is then in many churches, it only reinforces that error through a failure of discipleship and just lets us stew in it, which is setting us up for disappointment, disillusionment, and then ultimately deconstruction. And a 2B and an example of leadership that is modeling, yeah. modeling the cultural aspect of all of this. Okay, so let's go to that. Let's go back to that leadership thing that I pinned earlier. You talked about that there's a crisis of leadership in the evangelical church in America, and you experienced that very acutely and up close. When you step away from your immediate circumstance, your, your presenting symptom at your church, and you look broadly at the American church, how do you diagnose that leadership crisis? What do you see as being the root of it? You know, I've always, when I've talked about my book, I've always sort of referenced 
People leave churches. They've left churches for decades. This isn't new. People get upset. They leave. What's happening in the United States in the past, let's say, five to 10 years, maybe seven years more narrow, you know, since 2015 on, which was exacerbated by COVID. But like in this era, it's not just one person leaving one church with one bad leader. It's really becoming, it's the norm. It's just another day, another crisis. And and you can, you know, you can be like, well, that's just one. There's many little pastors and little home churches. Of course, I've gone to them. I still go to them. But but that's, you can't, like, I, I think the, the trend in American Christianity is now either pastors burn out and leave those small churches or they grow and they implode. And there's so many so many that there is something intrinsically wrong. I mean, I mean, even as we speak now, we're a week after the SBC blowout, right? I mean, so this is like ongoing. This isn't just one or two bad cases. This is systemic, bad. We want to protect this, what they are calling the institution of church, but really it's, it's, it is that. It is an institution. It is not the body of Christ. I think almost the fight that the leaders have taken has been to protect this this human-made institution of church, as opposed to the true body of Christ, which is why, like we we're talking a little bit before the show, you're in a you know people who now go to like little home groups and whatnot. Those home groups are flourishing now because there's an understanding and there's a wrestling that I see even with my former church mates who now go to you know some of those home group churches. That's different than small group. This is really a home church where you're doing life with these people. You don't have a superstar pastor coming on the weekend. You're with these people. You're experiencing life. You're walking through the scripture and prayer and breaking of bread. And there's a difference because that is a true understanding of what church is. I'm not saying you shouldn't meet in a church with 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 people. But if you don't separate the institution of church and your attempt at protecting that, as the SBC, as an, as an example, just did for decades and years at the cost of many lives that were speaking the truth and were ignored. And if you can't separate that from what the biblical true bride of Christ is, which is us, we, you, me, all. I think until we can see that clearly, I don't think we can really fight for the church. So it reminds me of a story just before COVID hit. It actually was March of 2020, right before the shutdown. I, I spoke at one of the last conferences that I went and traveled to speak at because there were none after that. And it was a, a mega church. And I was one of the few speakers who was not a mega church pastor. And at lunchtime, we were all sitting around all the speakers, eating our meal and kind of conversing around all the different crises that had emerged, and uh, including your church and other churches in our area. And, and every single pastor at that table had been a part of a mega church, including the church we were sitting in, that had a, a massive crisis of leadership because of some huge failure. And as we're all swapping these stories and, and talking about our own experiences with them, I asked the question of the others at the table, uh, do, you, do you people think that this is a case of just uh, bad character, individual bad apples, as we say? Or when you look at the number of these stories, is there something systemic at work here, something that's structural and systemic? And it was kind of shocking because around the table, it was, oh, no, 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 no. It's not systemic. It's it's not about how we do church. This is the failure of individual leaders to have accountability or to build their, their character or to commune deeply with Christ. And certainly those had to be components. But I was kind of struck by their reluctance to accept the notion of a systemic problem. And they want to just make it all about, it's a little bit like gun violence that we're seeing right now yeah. in the wake of another yes. mass shooting, right? Oh, no, we don't have a problem with guns. It's individual bad actors. It's people right. with mental illness only. I'd argue we have a both and situation going on here, just like Can in church. Can that to race and the issues with race? I mean, I think, again, right. same thing. I mean, these are all, right. I, I do think there's a systemic problem in the United States as it pertains to church leadership. I do. And I think that's, I think it's harder to resolve it if you, I mean, you got to admit first to the problem, but it is a harder cancer to fix when it's not widespread. So it's easier to be like, oh, it's just one apple. We're fine. Don't mess with us. But I, I think until a, a, enough leaders of godly biblical churches, Christ-centered honoring churches, get together and understand that and are willing to acknowledge the severity of the problem. I just don't think we're going to get any kind of cure. And I think the cure is there. We know the cure. His name is Jesus. And like, I think, you know, why don't we, why don't we change? Even, I mean, to me, it's very frustrating. I, I would imagine this is when people who are deconstructing even now, like I'm sort of out of that season, I guess, but I've been so changed by the process. But I think, you know, I think it would be so hard to watch even the most recent debacle of the SBC and like 
my goodness, like, why aren't people leaders running for a solution? Like, it just, I feel like we're like Washington. Like, it takes so long. Like, really, guys, like, repentance, really, like, God can change everything in a moment, in a second. And why are we dragging our feet on doing the right thing? What what are we worried we would lose? Individuals like myself who have walked away, who have in some ways lost a lot, I think you're able to, when you're in that position of weakness and brokenness, shake off the dust and see Jesus still with you. Like, you know, I think this was my aha moment is in the depth of my despair, in my deepest darkness. I, even when I felt and accused God of having gone or sided with them, I had this one moment when it was darkest, when I sensed the the presence of Christ so deeply and it came through I mean, again, I, I hate to be so basic in Sunday school, but it came through his word. I, on a whip, you know, I remember being so aggravated and I thought, how could even reading the Bible make a difference? After all these years of reading the Bible, I felt so aggravated with all of it. And I just remember being like, well, what, who, who else do I have? And I opened the scripture and I landed on Psalm 22. And I'm telling you, Sky, I felt like God was well, first, it's that psalm that talks about, oh, God, how, why have you forsaken me? And it goes into this deep, deep lament. And as I was reading it, first, I felt seen and understood like I'd never before. And so when all the gloss was gone, when all the status, all the numbers, all the worship songs that make your hairs rise, all these things that we value were gone, all I had left was Jesus. But but additionally, in that moment, I had this I remember having this crisp aha moment, which seems, again, so basic, but it was so revolutionary to me, which was that chapter wasn't just about me and God ministering to me through his word. It was about Jesus, who later was the one who was crucified. It was a prophetic psalm about him. And it was as I was reading it, I just sensed, like, not only does he understand me, he's been me. He's walked this path. That brings up something I wanted to hit in your book, which was... I think one of the most important and profound and beautiful parts of the book, which is, you mentioned, and I don't have the quote exactly in front of me, but that sometimes when people are going through these seasons of disillusionment and struggle and dark night of the soul, deconstruction, whatever you want to call it, sometimes what they're experiencing is just normal. Yeah. It's just normal life. And, and, and Psalm 22 is a great example, right? You obviously have that Davidic Psalm written 3,000 years ago that was experienced by someone in the ancient world, you have Jesus echoing that psalm, quoting that psalm in his suffering on the cross. And Christians throughout the history of the church have used that psalm to express their own lament and grief and pain and feeling of isolation. That's just a common shared human and Christian experience. And when we encounter it, we don't need to catastrophize as if something abnormal is happening to us. This is as normal as breathing. It's as normal as aging. It's as normal as anything else in the human experience. Why do we make it like the sky is falling because I'm having a really rough season? Well, and I again, I think I think because we haven't seen it modeled enough at the time. There top. you go. You know, and and I think there have been leaders who have stood against that, and they've been shot down sadly. And you know, the good guys sort of, you know, like they're not the ones that are continuing to grow, even though some of them have had an immense I've written books. I remember reading Radical um, by David Platt years ago and being really as a 20 some year old or 30, whatever I was at the time, um, reading it, being profoundly impacted by that book because it verbalized what I had experienced and felt. And and of course, David Platt's still famous and he you know makes it all the shows, but but really he's critiqued heavily. I mean, he's not walked an easy path. And yeah, especially lately, out. he's taken a lately. lot of slings and arrows. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I mean, no need to, there are, there are others, but the point is there has to be more of those men and women and I think that's part of the other tension is I think this is where now the culture, whether it's the debate between the role of, you know, women in the church and how that interacts. I mean, all these other side, you know, things that have played a part, how the church has, I mean, a lot of the deconstruction language have has also melded with the LGBTQ, you know, the racial issues, right. the female, you know, the entire feminist and just generally what is the role of women in the church. And, and, and I think... I think this is, again, a, a, because we've lost trust in the leaders, leaders haven't been able to, I think, teach in a humble and meek way what the Bible truly teaches on these things. We've been driven as now big church to stances on on these big issues. And so this is why many people like myself who have walked through deconstruction and, and are falling on the side of faith and of Christ and of the Bible as still being the true, literal, you know, inspired word of God – I know, you know, many of us, I think, who are like me now would say, I have no political home. Of course not. Like, I wouldn't 
identify with either of those political homes. And I would never go to a church that would have that bias and, and on, like, you know, or any, you can't pin me on any issue. I've had conservatives call me a progressive and progressives call me. I mean, a lot of us have that, 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 that kind of, you know, people who just can't quite peg you, but because we are not that supposed to. That's the entire holy post, frankly. <laughs> right. And isn't that, isn't that what we've been called to as Christians? It's yeah. not to be um, a certain party or a certain sect, but really to be different and set, set apart by our, Christ-likeness, not perfectly. I certainly wouldn't say I, I, I obey Christ or live Christ-like fashion on a on a daily, consistent basis. I mean, there's always that patient that's like, "What? You call yourself a Christian?" But the reality is, over time, there's a recognition of when we are wrong and a humble repentance of that and a desire deep down to change. Your your point about modeling this or leaders modeling this for us is really important. But there seems to be this trend, especially in American evangelicalism, that says. It's okay to be transparent about a struggle after you're already through it. When you're on the other side and it's all resolved and it's tied up neatly in a bow and you've got your book to write about it, that's okay. But when you're in the midst of it, you better darn well keep your mouth shut. You can't be honest and transparent about the struggle you're having at the moment. And I know plenty of leaders who feel that way, that they have doubts. Maybe it's not pro- like doubting the existence of yeah. God or, or even Christ, but they're they're doubting smaller elements of the way they've been taught or their faith or the model of the church or maybe some cultural or political stance that they thought went hand in glove with the with the gospel but doesn't and they're not allowed to express that because it'll blow up in their face yeah you know i i I think when you care enough about living a holy godly life you're less concerned about the ramifications of living an authentic honest life i i I still tell people like i I certainly not put myself in a category of someone who no longer has questions sure i think this is going to be the state of affairs i have tensions and questions and struggles that continue. You know, I still wrestle with sin. I still wrestle with why God allows things to happen. I mean, things that sometimes have big ramifications on my life and other times just annoyances. Like, really, God? Like, you look like you're going to fix it. Like, I still, it's okay to admit that to people. It's freeing. I think where I would challenge an individual and where I think we need to sort of grow up as we, we can no longer blame our struggle on our leaders. Like, I think we need to move past that. Okay, we got a leadership crisis. Like, they need to get their act together. But in the meantime, there are many people in the pews who, A, could be the next leaders. And and B, like, we've got... Um, I I believe one of the hardest things coming out of deconstruction is how do you now put yourself back in a church under the authority of a pastor? That to me has been the biggest struggle. Mm -hmm. I mean, regularly people who, it's not that they don't love the Lord and are obedient to his word and want to be godly. It's that they no longer have the whereabouts to trust a system that has been toxic to them. Yeah, And so they are Christians who are homeless, churchless. And I think this is a, this is, this is to me the big challenge of the next 10 years is how do you save the church, you know, which obviously, again, we're the body of Christ, so nothing's ever going to happen to the church. Jesus protects us. But still, there is a structure of going to gather together and to, to do certain communal things that I think this is the biggest tension is how do we now as individuals trust one another again? And how do we stop blaming our leaders for not showing up? Because that's easy to do. And yeah. that's where I've so. Let's wrap up with this question. Um in the book, you say this, the first step to reconstructing your faith is to start by telling the truth. Yeah. There's certainly truth telling that needs to go on with the, the toxic dysfunction of a lot of our leadership, but you're right. And for many of us, that's where it stops. We just blame the leadership for being whatever it is, but we don't hold ourselves accountable and tell the truth about ourselves. We don't look at the plank in our own eye yeah. rather than just the speck in the leader's eye. So what are some of the steps you took to be able to speak the truth when you were in that season that moved you towards yeah. health? I, um, I, I sought help. Um, I first, I got a spiritual director. I could tell that I needed mooring. I, I lost my Christian community. So I think a lot of, and then I eventually got a therapist and it was a, it was a Christian woman who's my therapist continues to be. I, I think even that movement towards increased, I think more Christians are seeing therapists than ever, which is a good thing. I don't think that's a bad thing, but they, some of it is because we no longer have places where we can get any kind of spiritual help, right? And so you need a place to tell your story. So to me, I didn't know where else to find it. And I, I found godly people who I could 
poor, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously very verbal, so not many people can handle all of this stuff and who understood the dynamic of a church. But it was even little things like people in my life. There were two or three people. I work in a ministry. I run a ministry, actually. I continue to do so. And so the people who work on in the ministry knew the struggle. We were praying together through it. So I never isolated the fact that I was struggling from the people who were close to me. And we continued to show up. I didn't quit the ministry. I, I didn't, you know, there were moments where I'd feel hypocritical, but I understood that deep down my desire was to find the truth to be in the truth, to honor the Lord. It's just that I was genuinely struggling and they just stayed the course with me. And so I think you find that two or three people, if you can't afford therapy, fine, just find again, my sister was one of them. My assistant is the other, like, and so it doesn't have to be a lot of people, but one or two people that you can genuinely, who, who don't have anything to gain from this, who are not trying to sway you to one side of the political debate or the other, who genuinely want you to find that peace that is promised to us through Christ. And, and, and if it means going to the therapist, by all means, start going. And now I still go to the therapist because she knows so much of the story. It's easier to keep telling her stuff than to start fresh with, you know, but, and then eventually you just integrate back in because you realize like, you're, God still loves you and you're still, you like nothing, like, nothing has changed after all these years. Like the truth is that problems still arise. Jesus is still the truth and the answer, no matter how much you fight it. And that God's word is the means for us to understand him more and to grow in that. And, and are some days better than others? You better believe it. But it's a process that every day brings us closer to meeting him, which is ultimately the cure. Amen. Lena Abu Jamra, thank you so much for the book. It's called Fractured Faith, Finding Your Way Back to God in an Age of Deconstruction. And for your honesty and willingness to share your story, I know lots of people who need those guides and the people who are a few steps ahead of them on this path, and, and you're proven to be one of them. So we appreciate that. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Holy Post Media. Production assistance by Julie Betcher. Editing by Jason Rugg. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by supporting us at patreon.com forward slash holy post. Also, be sure to leave a review on iTunes so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit holypost.com for show notes, news stories, Holy Post merchandise, and much more.